For this presentation, I have collected a couple of example videos of pneumatic components and how they work. These videos are all from industrial manufacturers. The next video will illustrate our VEX pneumatic components and show you how they connect and work. This video will describe how industrial pneumatic systems work. These five types of components represent the most common elements used in these systems. The ultimate goal of this entire collection of components, in most cases, is to create motion that will do some type of work in an industrial setting. Pneumatics is one of the most widely used technologies to automate repetitive processes. Some common applications might be to move product from one place to another, or to press or clamp pieces of a product together. To best understand how the system works, we will start at the beginning with a compressor and follow the process through to the end goal of motion. The compressor generates the energy that powers the system in the form of compressed air. In order to generate compressed air, the compressor draws in atmosphere from its surroundings and squeezes it or confines it into a smaller space, creating the energy needed to drive the system. Once compressed, the air needs to be dried and cleaned so that harmful particulates such as rust or dirt does not clog up the moving parts in the system. The compressed air will travel through a tube or line to the next component, called an air preparation unit, or FRL. FRL is short for filter, regulator, and lubricator, which are common pieces that make up the air preparation unit. Typically, the first unit in the air preparation system is what is called a bulk liquid separator which circulates or spins the air using specially shaped veins. The rapid circulation of the pressurized air sheds unwanted moisture due to centrifugal force. The next unit is a filter, which further removes particulate and moisture in a two-stage process. Just like in the bulk liquid separator, a series of veins or louvers in the filter circulates the air in the first stage. In the second stage, the air passes through a screen of sorts, called an element, in order to catch unwanted debris. Once dried and cleaned, it is common to adjust the level of air pressure coming out of the compressor. This adjustment has an impact on how much force the system generates. Higher pressure allows the actuator to put out more force, and lower pressure creates less force. The regulator achieves this using a spring-loaded assembly. The knob on the regulator adjusts the force of the control spring to achieve a desired pressure set point. Whenever the downstream pressure level drops lower than the desired set point, the poppet or internal valve opens a pathway for the higher pressure upstream to flow downstream. This continues until the pressure in the system reaches the regulator's set pressure. At this point, the poppet or internal valve closes until there is a new downstream demand. It is also common to have a pressure gauge on a regulator so the user can monitor downstream pressure. Finally, in specific applications, such as air motors or pneumatic tools, a lubricator can be added to distribute a fine mist of lubricant into the compressed air to help lubricate downstream components. Now that the compressed air is clean, dry, and set to the correct pressure for the application, the next step is to direct it where to go to create motion. A directional control valve is used to achieve this task. This directional control valve has a series of internal pathways that can connect the air coming into the inlet port with one of two avenues to leave the valve, called working ports. Depending on the position of the moving element, which is typically called a spool, the air will be blocked from traveling down one pathway and allowed to travel down the other. The high spots on the spool, called lands, will block the air from proceeding down one path, while the lower sections on the spool, called grooves, will allow air to flow around them and proceed to one of the working ports. In this common type of valve, when the unit is not activated, the spool is forced to the left side of the valve by a spring. In this position, you can see that this land blocks air from going out the number four working port and instead is forced to go out working port number two because the grooved lower section of the spool allows air to flow past it and out to the number two working port. In order to change the direction of the air to the number four working port, the valve needs to be turned on. In most automated equipment, a PLC or programmable logic controller will instruct the valve to shift using an electrical signal. When the signal arrives at a portion of the valve called a solenoid coil, a magnetic field is created that pulls a centrical piece called a plunger towards it. 
When that plunger is unseated, it allows air from inside the valve, known as pilot pressure, to push the spool to the right. Once the spool reaches the far right side of the valve, the lands or high spots are now closing off the passage to the number two working port and instead directing the compressed air to flow to the number four working port. When the signal from the PLC is removed, the force generated by the electromagnet is also removed, at which point the spring on the plunger returns it to its normal state, which removes the air signal that is pushing on the spool. The spring on the opposite end will return the spool to its default position once again, directing air back out the number two working port. The PLC can now direct air to whichever port is needed whenever it is needed. The next component in the system, the actuator, will allow us to do some useful work with the air we compressed, cleaned, and redirected. In most applications, the purpose of changing the direction of the compressed air with the valve is to cause motion in different directions. Parker makes a wide variety of actuators, or cylinders as they are also commonly called, that will convert compressed air into motion. The most common type of cylinder is the rotted variety displayed here. The actuator will create motion using the energy of the compressed air that is supplied to it by the directional control valve. We can see that the working port number four is connected to the back or cap end of the cylinder. When the compressed air pushes on the piston, it is forced to move forward inside a hollow cylinder that is commonly called the body. The piston is attached to a rod that will extend as a result of the force generated by the compressed air acting on the piston. The actuator will continue to move in that direction until it reaches its physical limit, or if the force resisting motion, commonly called the load, is higher than the force of the compressed air, in which case the pressure regulator could be adjusted to a higher pressure. Now that we have completed the extension, we will need a method to retract the actuator to its original position. The directional control valve will achieve this by changing the direction the compressed air flows from number four working port to the number two working port. The number two working port is connecting to the head end of the actuator, and when the compressed air pushes on the opposite side of the piston, it will reverse the direction of the piston rod assembly. This reverse motion is typically referred to as retracting. For this actuator to retract, the air that is already filling the cylinder needs to go somewhere, which is commonly referred to as exhausting. The exhaust air is illustrated by the red color and is shown exiting the cylinder and flowing back through the valve, out the muffler, to the atmosphere. This system can repeat this process as often as the PLC tells it to move things from point A to point B in one example. In this example, the PLC is telling the actuator to move this product by sending a signal to the directional control valve, which is using the clean, dry, compressed energy to power the actuator. Pneumatics are also commonly used to press two components together in an assembly process to help form a finished good. Through the combination of Parker's air preparation, valve and actuator products, there's a wide range of applications that can be solved. Visit us at parker.com to explore all of the pneumatic products we have to offer. Pneumatic solenoid valves are one of the most common elements in pneumatic systems. They are used to control air supply to cylinders, grippers, or valve actuators. In this video, we explain how to find the correct pneumatic solenoid valve for your application. Directional valves are appointed with two numbers. The first number shows how many ports the valve has and the second number the amount of states. Directional valves usually have two, three or five ports. Selecting the correct port and state combination can be hard, so let me explain the four most common used pneumatic solenoid valves. A two two-way valve has two ports, in and out, and it has two states, open and closed. Two two-way valves are therefore often called shut-off valves. They can be normally open or normally closed. Normally closed means that the valve opens when energized. Normally open means the valve is open in rest position and closes when energized. They are often used in pneumatic applications where the supply of air periodically needs to be closed off. A three two-way valve has three ports and two states. These valves can be normally open, normally closed or by stabile. They are used when your appliance needs to be either vented or pressurized. 
An example is a single acting cylinder. The valve fills the cylinder through one port, but also vents the cylinder afterwards through the same port to realize a new working stroke. Another example is a five two-way valve. This valve has five ports and two states. These valves are often used in combination with a double acting cylinder or rotary actuator. The valves have one port to supply air pressure, two exhaust ports and two ports to connect your appliance. The pressure port is always in connection with one of the two appliance ports. The other appliance port is connected to an exhaust port. With the example of the double acting cylinder, it means that one chamber of the cylinder is pressurized while the other chamber vents and vice versa. Neymar valves are a special type that have a standardized design to directly mount them to a valve actuator. They are easy to mount, compact and reduce the number of hoses and fittings. Three and five-way valves can have one or two electric coils. One coil means that the valve returns to a rest position with a power loss. Two coils means that it switches by providing a short pulse to one of the coils. With power loss, these valves remain in the latest position. A five three-way valve has five ports and three states. It is similar to a five two-way valve, but it has an extra state in the center position. They always have two coils to switch the valve. These valves are monostable and return to the center position when the solenoids are not energized. Five three valves are available in three variants with closed center position, with venting center position, and with pressurized center position. This is often used in the field for safety, for example, to stop a double acting cylinder during power loss. If you know what type of valve you need, it is also important to choose the correct size. On our website, you can find more information to find the correct product for your appliance. Pneumatic cylinder is a linear actuator powered by compressed air to supply force on a load. The assembly shown here is the most common type of double acting pneumatic actuator used in industries. It consists of a piston rod. This rod transfers force of compressed air to the load. Cushioning pistons are assembled with this rod. These pistons prevent any hard shocks at the end of the stroke by enabling the piston to stop slowly and gradually. The piston reciprocates back and forth when there is pressure difference between any of the two sides. A static seal ensures airtight sealing between the piston and rod. Piston guide rings are assembled to prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact of piston and cylinder. Piston seal provides airtight sealing between the cylinder and piston. This whole assembly then goes into a cylindrical bore. This cylinder is generally made up of aluminium or steel. A cylinder cap encloses cylinder chamber in one end and the cylinder head encloses the chamber from the other end. Cushioning buffers and seals are installed on respective ends. Captive adjustable cushioning screws are installed on each end. These screws enable user to adjust the optimum cushioning at the end of the stroke. This whole assembly is held together with tie rods. These rods also provide compressive and tensile strength to the actuator. Air ports are screwed to the ends through which compressed gas flows in and out. A pneumatic valve is connected to these air ports using pneumatic hoses. The valve shown here is a five ports four-way valve. The ports A and B are connected to the cylinder. Port P is connected to the compressed air supply unit. Ports R and S are exhaust ports to which the pneumatic mufflers are attached. Now let's understand how a pneumatic cylinder works. The compressed air is supplied through inlet port P of the valve. The valve directs air to a particular direction, which we can observe in the animation. In this case, the air is directed to port A. This high pressure gas is then transferred to the cap end of cylinder through the pneumatic hose. This creates high pressure in the cap end of cylinder, which therefore pushes the piston towards the head end. This also pushes gas from the head end. This exhaust gas travels through the other hose and reaches the valve. The valve 
directs this gas towards poor S and allows it to escape through a pneumatic muffler. The gas muffler helps reduce any noise produced during exhaust. The process we just observed is the extension stroke of actuator. During the retraction stroke, the valve directs compressed air to the head end of cylinder. This causes the piston to return and air on the other chamber escapes from the exhaust port R. The theoretical force of actuator is the relative pressure on the piston multiplied by effective area of piston on which pressure is exerted. Here, the relative pressure is pressure of supplied air minus the atmospheric pressure. During extension stroke, compressed air can exert pressure on total cross-sectional area of piston. This gives us the expression of theoretical force as relative pressure multiplied by total area of piston. During retraction, the effective area of piston is reduced because the air cannot exert pressure on the area of rod. This gives us the expression of theoretical force as relative pressure multiplied by partial area of piston. Frictional losses on the interface of different surfaces also needs to be considered while designing pneumatic cylinder. The diameter of rod and length of stroke is also a determining factor for capacity of actuator. Now that you've learned about some industrial pneumatic components, how they're identified and how they work, let's see if we can apply some of that same knowledge to our VEX pneumatic components. I'll see you in the next video.